scripture today is coming from Galatians chapter 2, uh, starting with verse 11. If you want to turn and have that ready here in just a moment, we'll be looking at that. Have you ever had to confront someone about their actions or behavior? Now, if you're a parent, you know that's true. You've had to, to confront your kids uh, time and time again, probably. And uh, maybe sometimes you've had to confront your brother or sister. And maybe you've even had to confront your parents. You know, I've had to do that before. About something that they were doing or something that was going on in their life. But isn't it kind of hard? It's one of those situations that we really struggle with, especially when it's not somebody who's in our immediate family. You know, when it's somebody that is our brother and sister in Christ, we might be a little, have a little bit harder time wanting to confront them about some things that we see in their life. This morning in our scripture, the passage we're going to read about is about Paul and Peter. And think about this for a minute. Peter was the one that Jesus called the rock. Peter was the one that he, Jesus said he was giving the keys to the kingdom to. Peter is the one who was the one who stood up on the day of Pentecost and, and preached the gospel for the very first time. And so Paul... Can you imagine how Paul felt, who came very much later, who had persecuted Christians? Can you imagine when he had to confront Peter on an issue that Peter was falling short of? Something that he was not doing right. And so that's what we see here in our passage today. So let's, let's read about it in uh, Galatians chapter 2, starting with verse 11. And we're going to read down to verse 14. It goes on a little farther, but I, I'm going to stop right there. It says, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, and yet you live like a Gentile, and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Now let's, let's see what's going on here, and see why, why Paul had to confront Peter about his behavior. Peter had come down and was there at Antioch with them, and, and was there with all the Gentiles, which, by the way, a Gentile is... Someone who's not Jewish. Okay? Somebody who's not Jewish. And so he'd come down and he was fine with all the Gentiles, eating with them and, and you know, eating the same stuff as they did and just being a part of them. But then a group of Jewish people came down. And these were some who believed that you had to become Jewish to be a Christian. And when they came down, Peter kind of started siding with them and kind of quit eating with the Gentiles. Now, we may sit and think, well, what's the big deal about that? He was just his people he knew and, and so forth. We have to understand a little bit about the customs back in those days. Eating with someone was a big deal. And it showed acceptance of someone else. It is today, even for that matter. Uh, if you've ever been in high school, you know that there's sometimes the pool table. You know, where all the cool kids sit. And if you're not invited to be part of it, you don't sit there. You know? And so it means acceptance. Eating with someone is, a, and is, is accepting that person. And so when Paul, when Peter we started eating with just the Jewish who separated themselves from the rest of the, from the Gentiles, he was starting to show a little bit of, believe it or not, racism. You know, that the Gentiles weren't as good. Because remember, Jewish people were told not to associate with those who were unclean. And those who were unclean were Gentiles. But now that they were part of the gospel, now that they had surrendered to Christ, Christ had said that all things were clean. Remember, Peter even had a vision. And the vision that Peter had 
was of unclean animals coming down in a sheet. And he was told to, to, to eat them. Remember, Peter said, oh, no, I'll never eat anything unclean. Remember what, the, what God said to him? He says, don't make unclean what I have made clean. And that happened three times. And it wasn't too long after that that Peter then was called to go to a Gentile's house to preach the gospel. And it was amazing because God showed a big sign to him. He, put, he brought the Holy Spirit down on Cornelius' house, the Gentile, in his whole house. And, and Peter turned to the other Jewish people who were with him and said, if they got the Holy Spirit, how can we keep them from being baptized? In other words, how can we keep them from becoming part of the family of God? And so in Antioch then, when he's separating himself from the others, he's saying, they're not good enough. We're going to be separated. And so it really was a sense of a form of racism. And you know, in our country, we've been having a lot of talk recently about race. And there's reason for it. Because there's still some who think that people who are not like them are not as good. And we need to understand that when we are in Christ, we are all one. Remember what Paul says in Galatians a little farther down? He says that there is neither slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. He's saying we're all one in Christ. We're one family. It doesn't matter what color we are. It doesn't matter what language we speak. It doesn't matter what gender we are. What matters is that we are one in Christ. And that's why he confronts Peter this time. Because he was showing a favoritism a lack of care, a lack of love for people who weren't like him. And so he called them, Paul called him on the carpet. And he called him, he confronted him with his sin. You see, there are times when we may have to confront a brother or sister, even in the midst of their hurt. When they are hurting. And there's some reasons for that. One may be because the reason they're hurting may be because of some sin that is in their life. Because of some of the things they are doing, their behaviors in their life have brought sin, have brought uh, pain into their life. But other times, because they are hurting, sometimes people act out of bitterness, out of anger, or other behaviors that are destructive to them that are sinful. And so we need to confront them with it. But some people say, but, but are, should we just be quiet about it? Isn't that between them and God? Well, I don't think so. And here's why. We're told to restore those who are common sin. We're told to restore them. Okay? In Galatians chapter 6, 1, which is the verse that we read at the beginning of the, the, the worship time today, it says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves... Are you also may be tempted? Now you get that it says if someone is coming to sin, you who live by the Spirit should what? Restore that person gently. That means to bring them back in, to put get them back into a right relationship with God, to restore them. It doesn't say just pray for them. It doesn't say to just ignore the fact and hope that they'll get themselves right. It says to restore them. Now, a few things I want you to, to notice about that, though. The first thing, it says that they are caught in sin. They're caught in sin. That doesn't mean that if you see somebody do something wrong once, you get all over them about it. All right? That's not what it means. It's talking about being caught in sin. That is the idea of a habitual sin. Another word, a sin that they continually are doing over and over and over. Or it could be that it's just a sin that all of a sudden has become very prominent in their life. For example, if you know that someone is having an affair, you need to do something about it. Don't just sit back and go, oh my, that's just terrible. If you know the person, it's time for you to go to them and talk to them. And so if you see a pattern of sin in their life, that's when we go and we seek to restore them. But it also tells us to do it gently. To do it gently. In other words, it's not coming to bring a hammer. And pound them into, you know, uh, uh, doing what's right. But it's doing it gently. In Ephesians 4.15 it says this. It's, it tells us 
that we need to be speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. You get that? It's not judgmental. It's not coming at somebody harshly. Even though it may come to that sometimes. But at least at first we come to them gently. Explaining their sin and showing them where they are falling short. We speak the truth in love. Why do we do it? We don't do it so we can judge them. We don't do it so we can point our finger at them. We don't do it to condemn them. We do it to do what? To restore them. To bring them back into right relationship. And so we do it gently. We do it lovingly. We do it with their best interest at heart because we want them to be in that right relationship. Because why? We love them. We love them. And then the other thing it tells us, it says that we have to be careful we don't fall into sin. Now I've always wondered what that meant. And I think there's a couple of things. Number one, it is possible that if they're involved in sin, we could become involved in the same sin they are. But I got a feeling it's actually the idea that we are better than they are. Comparing yourself to them. You know, it's very easy when somebody is in a sin that they've been caught in, that they're trapped in. It's very easy for us to, to look kind of past our own sin and just see theirs and think that we are a little bit better than they are. We get into the comparison game. You know, well, I've got sins, but mine aren't as bad as your sins. Well, that's just kind of comparative, isn't it? So we need to be very careful that we don't fall into the sin of pride or the sin of being judgmental. And that brings me to my next point, and that is this. We don't judge the person, we confront the sin. There's a difference there. We don't judge the person, we confront the sin. Matthew chapter 7, and verse 1 through 5. Now this is a passage that a lot of people will use to say, oh, we shouldn't say anything to him because who, we can't judge somebody else. Okay, Here's what it says, and I want you to read this. And pay attention to what it says, because I think it's something that, different than what most people think. All right, it says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, here's what I want you to understand. What he's saying is when we judge other people, we need to realize we're going to be judged in the same way. The harsher we are in our judgment, the harsher the judgment is on us. And so we need to be careful about that. And he, then he goes on and he gives this idea of the person with the speck in their eye and, and the log in their other. The person with speck in their eye still has a problem, don't they? Right? They still have a problem that needs to be dealt with. But if we got a plank in our own, then there's a problem. And that's why he says that first, take the plank out of your eye. In other words, deal with your own sin first. Make sure that you have looked at yourself, that you have examined yourself, and that you are right with God. And if you've got some things you need to work on, then work on them. Do something. But I like that last part. It says, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Kind of get the point what he's talking about here? We still need to be removed. We need still to help them out. You know, if somebody's got a, a you know, some, a speck in their eye, they got something in their eye, we, we don't just say, well, you know, I'll, I'll pray for them silently. You know, that speck gets removed from their eye. And we don't come up and go, you've got a speck in your eye. You should not be hanging out in dusty places. <laughs> you know? We don't judge them like that. But what we do, we lovingly and we carefully help them to get that speck out. And that goes back to that idea of gently restoring them. Because somebody's got a speck in their eye, it hurts. It causes pain. And so we help to remove that which is causing them the pain. And so we do it out of love again. Out of concern for their well-being. And so, we confront one another out of love. But before we do, we need to examine ourselves first. And there's something else I want you to notice. When Jesus is talking about this, he's talking about brothers and sisters. He's talking about people who are in the family of God. 
For us to go out and tell people who are not part of the family of God and start pointing out their faults and such, it's going to be a little harder. Because they may not take to it. Now that doesn't mean that we don't ever point the people to the gospel. We don't ever say that they haven't sinned. We, we do get to that point. But it can't just be going out and, as I've seen in some places where people get up on the you know, soapboxes and just start telling people that they need to repent or go to hell. That they're vile sinners. We start by showing them the love of Jesus first. And how much he loved them. And he wants to be with them. You know, it's not really loving to let someone continue in sin without confronting them. It's not. We may think it is. We may think that, well, well I'm not judging that person. They've got to deal with that because that's between them and God. But it's really not. We are family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we need to be loving enough that we will help somebody to step up and, and gently restore them back into a relationship with God. By not doing so, says that we are not concerned about the relationship with God. We don't care about them enough to make sure that they have that abundant life that comes from Christ. Because when our relationship with Christ is marred, when it's not all it should be, then our life is not all it could be. And we won't help our brother or our sister to see the sin that they're caught in, the trap that they are in, and encourage them and love them enough to gently restore them when we really aren't loving people. For five years in the early 1500s, the artist Michelangelo lay on his back and he painted scenes depicting the fall and the flood on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. But the artwork started to fade almost immediately. And within a century of completing his work, no one remembered what the original paintings even looked like. Painter Biagio Biagetti, I think I'm saying that right, said in 1936, he said, we see the colors of the Sistine ceiling as if through smoke glass. In 1981, a scaffold was erected to clean the frescoes and that adorned the chapel. And with a special solution, Fabrizio Mancinelli and Gianluigi, <laughs> ah well, these Italian guys, gently washed a small corner of the painting. <coughs> And uh, they then invited the art experts to come and examine their work. Well, the results were just stunning. No one had imagined that beneath the centuries of grime there lay vibrant colors. And this wasn't the Michelangelo that was known by critics, art critics. They, they saw him as a master of form and that his paintings resembled sculptures more than paintings. But this new, quote-unquote, artist was also the master of color, azure, green, rose and lavender, all these colors that no one had seen for centuries. And their success prompted the restoration of the entire ceiling, and the task was completed in December 1989. It took twice as much time to clean the ceiling as the artist had to paint it. But the result was breathtaking. I don't know if you can see that picture up there. But the top was before, and this is after. And here's the point I want to make. When our brothers and sisters are caught in sin, there's a film over them. There is something that keeps them from really being the vibrant person that God wants them to be. It stops, it hurts their relationship with God. And when we come to them and share with them and help them to see the sin in their life, that they might repent of it, that they might confess it to God, they might admit their wrongdoing, then it says, God is faithful and just and will cleanse their sins and purify them from all unrighteousness. And so their relationship with God is whole again. If we're going to love the hurt, we may have to have a hard conversation with them. We have to maybe sit down and talk with them about things that are uncomfortable. As I was studying this week, I read about a preacher who some friends came two hours away talk to he and his wife. The preacher had some physical problems and he was blaming his wife somewhat for them and, and being very mean and kind of harsh with her. And she had bitterness because of it all. And these friends had seen this and knew they needed some more. 
and they loved him enough to come and talk to him. The preacher says he looks back on that and sees that as a moment of great joy now. At the time, he didn't see it that way. He saw it as just being painful. And just kind of peel away that layer of dirt. And enabled them to get their marriage back on track. And be able to do what God's work needed to be done. Maybe there's people you know who you need to talk to. Again, make sure you're not going with a judgmental attitude. Do it because you love them and you care about them. And ask God for the words to use. Ask Him what you should say, how you should say it. But don't be afraid to do it. And this needs to be among people that you know, among your friends, people who trust you and you know them. And bring them back into a right relationship with God. Restore them gently. Just as Paul had to confront Peter. We sometimes need to confront each other. But let's always do it with love in our hearts. And we want the very best for them. Just a moment, we're going to sing our song commitment. And we're going to use the song in the garden. And then sometimes it just comes together. We need to get together with one another and spend some time. And, and part of that time needs to be with Jesus. When we come together with a brother or sister in Christ that we need to talk to, we need to invite Jesus along with us. That he might come with us and spend that time together with him. That we might really get to know him in a way that we know otherwise. Just we're going to sing this. And if there's something in your life that's going on, maybe there's some struggles you're having right now. Maybe there's some sin you need to confess. We ask you to come forward. We have people who are willing to talk to you and pray with you about it. Maybe you need to give your life to Christ. Maybe you have never done that. And he says, hey, come to me and I'll give you rest. Come to me and I, and I will accept you. My arms are open wide. Come with me and, and let me wash you and cleanse you. And we, it's very simple what the scripture says. It says to, to believe. It says to repent. It says to acknowledge Him before men. It says to be baptized into Him. And it says to live our life then for Him. If you haven't done that, we encourage you to do that today. Talk to us about it. Find out what you can do so that you can have your sins forgiven. Have that relationship with God that can only come through His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's stand and let's sing. <laughs>